Kenneth Wolf. I was born in Mansfield, Illinois, and I'm 87 years old. I'll be 88 uh, April 12th, 2013. Northwest of London to a little place, it was a little town called Attleboro, and the place was called Defum Green. It was a 452nd bomb group. And in that bomb group, uh, each bomb group was composed of four squadrons. Uh, we had the 728th squadron, 729th squadron, 730th, and 731st. Our crew was in the 728th squadron. <laughs> when, you're, when you're a new crew, you don't get the best airplane. And uh, we got ready to take off on I don't know, about the third or fourth mission, I think it was. And we're taxiing down the runway and uh, starting to pick up some speed, and one of the engines fell off. <laughs> While you were on the ground? Yeah. Yeah, we were just getting ready to take off, starting to pick up a little speed, giving the engines gas, and then one of them fell off. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, uh, an old airplane that had been shot up and repaired so many times. It's what they call a war-weary plane. And so we, we didn't make that mission. Boy, I tell you, we were coming down on the bomb run and they opened up with anti-aircraft shells and anti-aircraft shells that's bursting all around. And this thing just sent pieces of shrapnel everywhere. And uh, uh, shrapnel uh, would hit the airplane, and it sound like hail on tin roof. Just bing, 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 bing. I got that helmet on in a hurry, and of course I it scared me. And you're in the tail of the plane, right? Yeah, I was back in the tail. I got my helmet on, and I scrooched down. I'm trying to make myself a little. And these fighter planes are coming in from the back, they're coming down from the top, they're coming up from the bottom, and from the front and the side, and we're we're just shooting and everything is moving. One of the anti-aircraft guns got locked on our plane. And it started exploding. And I could see it explode out there. And every time it, it just boom, and then here come another and exploded. And as it got closer, uh, I could see when it's you can see the red center exploding. It's getting close, and it was just boom. I was sitting there watching it and shaking, and finally I just quit shaking, and I knew. I was going to die. I mean, I just knew that if it exploded three more times, it was going to hit me. And about that time, there was another squadron of airplanes from another group went cross over us, just right real close, went over us. It confused that radar, and the radars would start shooting somewhere. It shot up, it was shooting up a cloud, I think. See, I had a total of 3,200 bullets I could shoot. Well, when we got back to the base, before I uh, got out of the plane, I thought I'd check my guns to see, uh, check to see how many bullets I had left. And there wasn't none in the boxes. And I checked them, and my left-hand gun had one bullet left, and my right-hand gun had two. Just imagine how many thousands of bullets went flying out of there. Over Germany at 25,000 feet, it's cold, 35 below zero. Now, I had flying boots that I wore uh, and uh, army socks, but my feet were still getting cold. I mean, no heat in those planes. You get, you just, with what you wear, it keeps you warm. So I wrote to Viola and asked her to 
buy me a pair of wool socks and send to me. And I thought maybe that would keep my feet warmer. So she was still in nurses training in Indianapolis and wool socks was a scarce item. Then I got them and uh, when I got them the very next mission I wore them. And so we was, the uh, fact is we were on the bomb and run with anti-aircraft shells busting, exploding all around. And shrapnel was hitting the planes. And my right sock, that sock that she had got for me, had somehow crawled down in my boot and was wrinkling it up and was bothering me. So I leaned down to pull that sock back up and just as I leaned down, of course I had two windows on each side of me, my head when I'm in my turret, and as I leaned down to pull up that sock, a piece of shrapnel took out both those wings where my head was. A minute before. So, uh, I said uh, that pair of socks saved my life. So on the 18th of March, 1945, our mission was to go to Berlin. And whenever you go into briefing and say you're going to Berlin, you you know that this is your last mission. You hardly ever survived going to Berlin. That's the capital of Germany, and they had so many aircraft guns around that thing. Uh, when they started shooting, it didn't look like just little puffs of smoke, they turned into black clouds of smoke. On the 18th of March, we went to Berlin and we bombed Berlin. It was just exploding everywhere. Just, and you could hear them, boom, boom. And other crews that we trained with lived in the same barracks. Planes exploded. Somehow we made it through. Uh, got to the coast of Holland. Raised right ahead towards England. We well, took off my oxygen mask and uh, kind of settled back on my little bicycle seat and uh, looked out the back. And our wingman. Well, that's to the left of me, but it'd be our right wing man, was kind of moving. And I wonder what the heck he moving around for. And about that time, he come out of formation, went right in underneath us. I looked down on him, and he looked up at me, but I knew him. But anyhow, they went in underneath us, and I thought, boy, they're awful close. And it wasn't a minute later that there was a crash. They had went in under us and something caused them to come up underneath us. Our propellers just cut that plane in pieces and I know the boy that I looked at, the propeller just ground him up. And of course they came up on the left side of our airplane right up and their propellers cut the nose off of our airplane, bent our left wing up like that, knocked out the two engines on that wing and the, the one on the first one on the right wing, it stopped. There we are, and they were stuck together. And while all this is happening, when they cut the nose off our airplane, our bombardier fell out without a parachute, and uh, some kind of wind turbulence or something caught him and blew him back in the plane. Cracked his pelvis, but he was in the plane. Our ball turret gunner had come up out of the ball turret. That's a little pod right underneath the plane. And he'd come out on the left side looking out the window and he lit up a cigarette. When the plane hit, it knocked him flat over to the other side. 
the front of the plane went up and the tail went down and I went up and I hit the top and knocked me out. I come to and that ammunition I had left in my box was, was laying on me. And I was fighting to get that stuff off and I got it off and looked out the back and I saw two parachutes. Turned out the two that I saw was our navigator. Somehow he got out of the front of that airplane. And the waist gunner, Jim Kenimer, the guy who was never afraid of anything, he was the other one that bailed out. I know uh, uh, Ronald Tucker was the ball turret gunner and uh, Jim uh, Tucker told me that later that Jim hollered, he said, let's get out of here, Tucker. And Jim pulled the pins off of the waist door to the airplane and he dived out. And Tucker couldn't find his parachute. There was trash everywhere when they cut the nose off. Papers and maps and everything was just flying. The boy that was the our uh, flight engineer and the top gunner, right? He stood right behind the pilot. And he had a, a gun that went around over the top. He came back through the plane, told Tucker, don't bail out, we got one engine. And he crawled all the way back through the tail and grabbed me just before I was getting ready to bail out. I had got my parachute and everything fixed and I got my rubber boat because I know that's water down there now. English Channel. And it's going to be cold. So I hesitated. And about that time he come back through the plane and grabbed me and said, don't jump. We got one engine. And meanwhile the pilot said, somehow shook our plane and shook that other one off. That plane just folded like this and dropped like a rock. Everybody died on that plane. So our two boys that bailed out, they, uh, some of the other planes went down and dropped some more rubber boats for them and they said they saw one guy climb into a boat. Of course everybody called Air Sea Rescue to get out and get them. Now this is just a little way off the coast of Holland and uh, we heard later that Air, when Air Sea Rescue got out there, there was nobody there. A few boats with machine gun bullets in them. And we were trying to make it back and we got about 90 miles to go. There's an emerging landing field on the White Cliffs of Dover that's about five miles long. And if we can make it to that thing, then we'll be safe. Of course, our plane, uh, we only got one engine and, and we're slowly losing altitude and we're headed for the White Cliffs and we're getting closer and closer and we're drifting slower, lower and lower. And the pilot come on and he said, uh, we got a chance to make one pass at it. If we don't make it, we'll go down and land in the water and, and they can come and get us out of the water because we'll be close to the shore. So, so he he said, I'm going to put the wheels down. So he put the wheels down, one of them didn't go down. So we, there, we have a crank and we all, we got in the bomb bay, of course it's in the bomb bay. We, we're taking turns trying to crank this wheel down and we don't know if it's down yet and we keep trying to cranking it and we're coming, the pilot says, I'm heading her in and we we think we've got the wheel down and uh, we just so everybody pilot said everybody in the radio room uh, in crash position and then so we got in there and uh, he he headed it in and we hope that that wheel hold because if it don't we're going to be in big trouble because if that wheel folds up on us and we'll get to what they call a ground loop and it'll bust that plane to pieces and who knows <laughs> who are we going to survive. But he's headed in and we just just had enough out of it. There's some trees at the edge there and we brush those treetops 
as we were coming in and landed and the wheel held. And we rolled, uh, our brakes was gone. Uh, somehow or other, the brakes wouldn't work. And we rolled down that run, long runway and we rolled and we rolled slower and slower. And finally it stopped. And we all crawled out of the airplane and kissed the ground. I mean, we really kissed it. And then we looked at our airplane. And oh, that left wing is supposed to be like this. It's up like this. The propellers and everything's all bent up on the, and the front of the whole front nose is gone. Well, they had a couple of machine guns up there in front and the bullet, the, the belt, the head bullet is hanging out. And the whole side, left side of our airplane is covered with blood. This is all them guys in the other plane. Our propellers ground them up. That was uh, mission number 18. We've, and they gave us, uh, I think, a week uh, leave. And we got to, to go to a rest home over on the west coast of England, south of, a little bit south of Liverpool, a place called Southport. Great big hotel. And that was a rest camp, a rest place for, uh, for rest and relaxation, I guess, for a little bit. The radio operator and I were buddies, the closest of the crew, I would say. So there's a place in, in London that we could stay uh, overnight because we, we had a two or three day pass and the Red Cross had a place we could stay overnight for 50 cents. So the next day uh, we decided we'd go down uh, to number 10 Downing Street which is the home of the Prime Minister. So we walked and walked and walked and went far down and we're down here at number 10 Downing Street, standing uh, not too far from the door, really, standing back over the side, kind of. And Princess Elizabeth come out of the door. And she come out of the door, went right past us, and went and got in a Rolls Royce and took off. I thought she had a big nose. <laughs> She was not exactly pretty. She's better looking now than she was then. When the war ended, we was confined to base. Before we were sent home, uh, I got to go on two uh, missions, humanitarian missions they were called. People in Holland were starving. We went on this to uh, Amsterdam. We're going to come in to drop this stuff at about 400 feet. We're coming in towards Amsterdam and the people's all out at the edge, edge of Amsterdam and we're at 400 feet so we could see them. And they're whooping and hollering and waving and uh, we flew right over uh, the open field there next to the town, dropped the boxes of, of food and, uh, and boy, uh, of course, we made a turn and I was watching and uh, them people was running out and grabbing them boxes and stuff, was small boxes of K rations. Uh, but, uh, oh boy, uh, for them it was wonderful. So, after you make five missions, you're awarded the air medal. And then, if you make another five missions, you're awarded another airman. And so it goes. But they, they don't give you another medal. They put it on the ribbon. Uh, it's an oak leaf cluster. So I made 23 missions. So I got an air medal and four oak leaf clusters. <laughs>
Toss to the day. Prepare your squad to honor this better. Fire, Commander. Honor Guard. Fort. Fire. Ready. 